Good morning. Good morning. I want to say a welcome to our visitors and guests. It's a pleasure to have you guys here with us. Um, to our regular family at Jesus Community Church, I've missed you. It's been a long time. Uh, some of you, it's been a long time. Others of you, it was just Thursday. You guys, I miss too. Um, we have quite a few Ask the Pastor questions that we're going to touch on today. And I'm going to kind of go through these quickly because I, I want to get to the, the word that God has, has spoken for today. Um, Lori DeBoer had sent me an email asking... Um, to the effect, what happens to, do people after the rapture have an opportunity to get saved? Wow. And that one simple question, she opened up an entire can of eschatological debate. Um, short answer, I believe so, yes. But, it's going to be very hard. And I believe this for a couple of reasons. Um, primarily, I believe that the tribulation period is set to fulfill God's promise to Israel in the book of Daniel, the 70 weeks. Um, I believe that the Gentiles will have an opportunity, but uh, according to what I see in Scripture, God is going to take the one who prevents the enemy from rising out of the way. I believe in part that's the church, but I believe specifically it's the Holy Spirit that is living in the church. The one who restrains will be gone. Well, it's the Holy Spirit that draws unto salvation. So I believe it is gonna be very difficult for anyone at that time to come to saving faith. I believe they will, but it's gonna be brutal and it will probably put them right on the chopping block. Okay, so short answer, yes, I have a, a longer detailed one that I will email you this afternoon. Um, so, again, that is my belief. I know some people have different beliefs. Actually, everybody has different beliefs on end times. Uh, I haven't yet met anyone that agreed with anybody else 100%. And I, I really look forward to seeing how wrong I was. So, we have another question here. It says, uh, in the days of the sacrifice lamb, what if you didn't have a perfect lamb? Uh, we are supposed to give the first fruits so if that was all we had, would it work? Okay, there, that's actually two different questions being addressed here. Okay, the sacrificial lamb is an offering that you give on behalf of your sins for forgiveness. Okay, uh, the first fruits, that's God's. That, that just belongs to him. And scripture makes it clear, the first fruits of your, your flocks, your herds, your garden, your vineyard, uh, your harvest, all of that belongs to God, up to and including man. Okay, uh, you read in the book of Exodus, uh, God declared the first fruits to be his, and as a result, uh, he had a census taken of all the people of Israel, and he chose the tribe of Levi. Instead of the firstborn of each family, he chose the tribe of Levi. These are mine. But the numbers didn't quite line up, so in order for the full righteousness to be parceled out, God required that there be an offering given to make up for the lack. Now, where does this go here? The sacrificial lamb was something that had to be perfect. Um, no blemishes, okay? And scripture is, is pretty blunt about what a blemish was. Um, if you could not afford a sacrificial lamb, uh, there was allowance made where you could buy two turtle doves or two pigeons to use in place of that. There's also a place where you could go in with a neighbor and buy a lamb. Um, we see in the New Testament when Jesus is cleansing the temple, I believe this is part of what was going on there. People that lived a far way from the temple could come to the temple and buy a lamb there to sacrifice. And I believe what the, the priesthood was doing was they were taking a $4 lamb and charging $15 for it. They were charging usury. Okay because it was supposed to be the same value of the lamb that you left at home. Uh, first fruits, that's always God's. That belongs to him only. Okay, so we see 
in, in the tithe of today. Uh, God loves a cheerful and generous giver. Uh, we set a tithe at 10% because that's what the word tithe means. I don't believe God wants just 10%. It's all his. It all belongs to him. And I believe God will lay on your heart what he expects of you to give, and he will allow you to do so generously and joyfully. Okay? So, um, short answer, two different questions. If you didn't have a perfect lamb, uh, you had to find a perfect lamb. Or two turtle doves or two pigeons. Um, all the first fruits, those belong to God. They're his anyway. So, the last question that we have... Uh, says, as humans, it is often diff difficult to forgive. Is it difficult for God to forgive us? No. Why? There's two things here that make this important. One, God is not like us. God sees everything. God knows everything. God is perfect. So to try and ascribe to God our thoughts, our struggles, our emotions is faulty just in, in its basic premise. But second and more importantly, God tells us in his word that he is just to forgive us our sins. He is perfect in his justice and the price has been paid. So when we come to him repentant, asking for forgiveness... A broken and contrite heart he will not despise. He has no difficulty forgiving us because he has already seen the price paid. It's taken care of, done, accomplished. So when we come to him asking for forgiveness, instantaneously he forgives. No struggle whatsoever. That's what we ascribe to. That's what we really should be doing. Because the measure that we've been forgiven, what have we been forgiven? Everything. What then do we have right to hold against anyone? Nothing. Okay. Not that it's easy. That's, that's a, a, a very key point to this question. It is difficult. It is not impossible. Okay. So, um, for those of you that wrote the questions, I will leave these up here for you to come and get. There's a little bit more detailed explanation written on the back and um, some more scriptures for you to look at. So, Already, we've covered a lot of ground. We are talking about spiritual warfare. We're in a battle to the end. Okay, It's not a battle that uh, we're going to lose. It's a battle that the victory is already assured. Okay, So it's like going into a soccer game knowing the score is already set. You're not playing for fun because there are people out there that will take your legs out, break your ankle... That's not fun. <laughs> yes, I speak from experience. But we are in a battle, and we've talked already uh, the maxims of war. Three of the maxims of war are, are you have to know your enemy. We spent a couple weeks talking about the devil and all his minions and his plan for us. <coughs> for us. Uh, we're in the, the section know yourself. And then we will move on to the section, Know Your Battleground. Now, I kind of intentionally misled you because in Know Your Enemy, your enemy doesn't just include, include the, the devil. Okay? Because, see, we are our own worst enemy. Because the devil can't make you do anything. All he can do is put it in front of you. It is your choice to pick it up or leave it lie. All right? So... We have people, I know people, I grew up with people who, man, there was a demon manipulating everything. And they were so on the lookout for demons. I, I have a, a, a good friend of mine whose father believed that demons would come out of the TV. So he kept the TV in the closet. <laughs> and he pulled it out when the cowboys played. <laughs> Evidently, even the demons didn't like the cowboys. They didn't come out when the cowboys played. So... Seriously, this, this was, you know, we don't want our kids being influenced, you know, all the demons that are controlling the airwaves. and Okay, maybe so, but we don't need to worry about them. Okay, because greater is he that lives in me than he that lives in the world.
okay? So an awareness, yes. A fear, no. All right? So we're talking about us. Know yourself. And this is a, a subject, that honestly, I've struggled with teaching on this subject because I don't feel up to the task. Okay? I know what I believe, but I don't know that I'm up to being able to properly convey to you how that plays out in Scripture. So, today we're going to talk about the sin nature. Okay? Last week we talked about you know, first you have to know you're his. How do you know you're his? This week we're talking about after you've become his, what happens? Okay? Now, I've done a lot of study. I've done a lot of reading. I've talked with a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I believe the dilemma, the, the problem that we have where we have people that talk about indwelling sin and the two natures and other people say absolutely not there is one nature I believe the difficulty comes in with our understanding our interpretation of what we mean okay my understanding and that's what you're getting today because I'm talking afterwards you can share your understanding with each other and, and that's fine my understanding this is indwelling sin according to blank all right, so you take this with a grain of salt, you hold it up in light of scripture like I hope you do everything I say each week. All right, so elementary question today is this, are Christians sinners saved by grace or are we a new creation? Do we have a sinful nature indwelling sin or not? Yes. <laughs> And here's where we run into problems. Interpretation, definitions, okay? Um, I know John MacArthur <coughs> espouses the belief that there is one nature. We are not called to be schizophrenic creations, that we don't have a split personality. Uh, I agree with that. However, Paul makes mention in Romans, and, and to be honest with you guys, you want to study this, you're going to have to dig deep in Romans. You're going to have to look in Corinthians throughout the entire New Testament, especially in Paul's writings. He deals with this subject. And at times it looks very definitively one way, and at times it looks very definitively the other way. Now, in studying this, what do I believe that the sin nature is? My, my best shot at this is capacity. Capacity. You have the capacity to sin. As a matter of fact, when you come to Christ, you retain a predilection, a, a rut of life, an inclination to sin. You've been taught your whole life about sinning. You're a good learner when it comes to sinning. We've all learned ways to sin just through living life. Okay? When we come to Christ, bam, instantaneously, we are a new creation. The old is gone. It has been crucified. It has been buried. It is resurrected anew. We are a new creation. Unfortunately, when we come up with that new creation that stands absolutely perfect, absolutely righteous before God, absolutely holy before God, we also bring with us the memories, the habits, those things that God finds detestable, those things that we needed to be saved from. Okay? So, as a Christian, do I have indwelling sin? I have a predilection. I have the capacity to sin. Everyone in this world ever has been, ever will be, has this capacity. As a matter of fact, until you come to Christ, that's all you've got. Because even the good you do as an unbeliever is held up in light of your sinful nature. <clears throat> so while you may do moral good things, it does nothing to merit favor on God's behalf. 
Do you want a little less hot place in hell? Because that's really what the question is. All right? There are people in this world that have been incredibly altruistic. They have loved, lived philanthropic lives, helping people left and right, but they do not know God. He does not know them. Their end in eternity is the same as those who have railed against God the entirety of their lives. All right? So, everybody has the capacity to sin. Before Christ, that's the only capacity that you have. After Christ, you have the capacity to not sin. You, you see that? You have a choice. Not just a choice whether to do or not do. You have a choice to be or not be. Now, am I a sinner saved by grace? No, I'm not a sinner. <clears throat> Absolutely not. Do I sin? Yep. Yes, I do. I, I still sin. But sin is not what defines me. Before God, sin is not what defines me. When I stand before God, what defines me is His righteousness. That is given to me through the blood of His Son, through the sacrifice of His Son, through the death of His Son. And I know this for true because His Son was resurrected. Okay? So, what defines me and my life is no longer sin. There's two choices. You can let sin define your life or you can let God's righteousness define your life. There's no other choice. Okay? So, is there indwelling sin? Yeah, I still have habits. I still have <clears throat> things that I fall for over and over and over again. Now, as a Christian, as I'm maturing, these should become less and less. So, at some point in this life, I'll be absolutely perfect, right? Wrong. No. Because what I've found in my life, and what Christy has shared with me, she's found in her life, and what I'm believing and I'm betting each one of you will find in your lives is that as God works out sin in your life, he reveals new sin. Oh, see, it's not just what we do, it's what we think. <coughs> you know, uh, you look at the Garden of Eden. They had one rule. Don't eat that. And they messed it up. So God established the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses. And Israel messed that up. Don't do this. See that? Don't do that. Well, then we come to the New Testament, and we see the absolute abysmal failure of man to, to accomplish even one of these commands. And Jesus makes it harder. He says, oh, it's not what you do. It's what you think. It's what's in here. You, it's not enough to kill your brother if you hate him. You've committed the crime. It's, it's not enough to not commit adultery if you've looked lustfully. You've committed the crime. Dang. I was struggling with just the ten. And I would have struggled with just the one. But now he's made all of it open. So we have... Patterns of behavior that are established in our lives that God reveals to us and says, okay, we need to get rid of this. Now, here is what separates Christian from non-Christian. A Christian can get rid of those. You can overcome those sins. Okay? I used to have a foul mouth. My father was a sailor. My brother, a lot of you got to meet him, you know, the Catholic hostel that's at the corner over there. <laughs> He taught sailors how to cuss. Okay? And I had a potty mouth. I had a septic mouth. All right? God started poking me. You're supposed to be my witness. How can you talk like this? Well, because they talk like this. I become all things to all men, God. No. I have called you out of that to be my representative. 
I don't want you to be a poop representative. <laughs> you have got to be the absolute holy and righteous representative that reflects me. This is what First Corinth or Second Corinthians chapter five talks about being the ambassadors of the message of reconciliation. Now, does that mean that I have to be perfect? Yep. Does that mean I'm going to be perfect? No. Nope. Because he says, "Be holy as I am holy. Be perfect." as I am perfect. Now, thank God for the message of hope that His perfection is imputed to me. His Spirit lives inside of me. Why does His Spirit live inside of me? To convict me. To show me what is wrong. To say, hey, you, you see this? Yeah. That, that's not good. That's got to go. This has got to go? Why? I had to turn off the TV. We, we had um, satellite, I don't even remember what it was, we had satellite. And, and there are certain channels that I just loved. You know, I, I love the detective stories, I love the history stories, I love the military channel. But what I noticed when I did those things is I watched them. And when I was watching them, I was not being intimate with God. So we got rid of the TV. So no, no more satellite. Well, I love to read. I have always loved to read. I was reading before I went to school. I used to read the TV guide to my brother so he would know what channel to put on that I could not watch. <laughs> All right? And I, I love to read. And uh, about a year, a little over a year ago, God told me that he wanted me to lay the books down. And he only wanted me to spend time in his work. God, you know how many hours a day I read? You want me to spend all that time in your word? Yep. Okay. Okay. Now, some of you, you guys can read, and it's not a problem. Great, fantastic. Tell me how the story went. <laughs> but for me, reading was a problem because I would not read things that would glorify God. I would read things that would consume my mind and turn my thoughts away from God. And I would spend more time reading than I spent with God. So I had to go, all right, God, you want me to lay it down? I'm laying it down. I'm, I'm laying it down. Okay. Now, that is something specific to me. That's an area that God has revealed to me that I need to be very cautious in. Okay. Some of you might have that same area of weakness. Some of you probably don't. Most of you probably don't. But you do have your own areas of weakness. I have never had a problem with alcohol. I don't like the taste. I don't like the smell. Okay, so when somebody's like, well, you want no? I really don't. Now, if you drink, hey, I have no problem. Scripture does not say you should not drink. It says do not be drunk. Now, if you have a problem getting drunk, then you have sin. And you might have sin with just regular drinking. That's between you and God. Okay? But for me, it's never been an issue. I have an incredibly addictive personality. When I find something that I like, I want it over and over and over again. Okay? Thank God he <clears throat> chose to not, I don't like alcohol. Okay? That's not a weakness that I've ever stumbled in. But some of you, that might be. Okay? It might be. So, for me to sit here and cast judgment on you because you read books is inappropriate. Because that's not what God has told you. That's not what he's told me to tell you. That's something he's told me I need to deal with. Okay? So, indwelling sin. Paul says that in uh, first, uh, Romans chapter 7, he talks about doing the things you want to do and then doing the things you don't want to do, and it's a mess. All right? <coughs> now, I want to share with you, I'm not going to try and explain <coughs> what Paul means in this passage. I've, I've heard it broken down four or five different ways. What I want to stress to you that is important is that you are in a battle, every day with the proclivity that you have to sin. Okay? Every day. You have the capacity to sin, but beyond the capacity to sin, you still have, I still have a desire to sin. I look at some of the things that God says, I don't want you to do that, and I think, God, that's fun. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. Am I going to exchange the joy of the Lord for a moment of happiness? Now, you understand what the difference is, right? 
Happiness is transient. It's fleeting. Okay? It's just like the drug addict. He gets really happy when he takes the drug, but then he comes down, and the high that he experienced is mirrored by the fall that he falls, the depth that he falls. And so he, he has to go back to grab that high, but this time it takes a little bit more to get the high. We're just like that with sin, okay? Because nobody can just stop at this point. God, I'm only going to sin to this point, and I'm going to stop right here. Just let me get to that point. God says, no, you can't. Step back. Step back away from this sin. But God, I'm not going to go past this line. Yeah, that's a line you have set arbitrarily. That's not the line that God has set. What is the line that God has set? Be perfect. Be perfect. Okay? Now, we all have God's Spirit living inside of us. That makes us aware of sin. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm sure I'm probably one of the only people in this church. When I come to that point, and I choose Tuesday, I, I failed Tuesday. I absolutely blew it Tuesday. I struggled all day. I struggled, I struggled, and I got to the point where I said, I'm done, I don't want to struggle anymore, bam! And I just went, <clears throat> I not only fell on my face, I rolled over, splashed it on myself, splashed it on others around me. I just, I, I got to the point, I've been praying, God, save me from this, God, deliver me from this, God, give me hope in this, and God was right there with me, but he wasn't giving me the answer I wanted, and I said, fine! And I chose to embrace that. And even as I'm having my little hissy fit, there's a part in my head that is going, stop. What are you doing? This is not what God desires of you. This is not the righteousness that he has given his life for. This is not what he wants. Stop. But my flesh is going, I'm all over this. I'm all over it. Now, I think, um, I'm not sure. Somebody posted on Facebook the, the story about the, the old wise Indian that was speaking to the grandson and told him the story of, you know, inside of you lives the, the black wolf and the white wolf, and the black represents all the bad, and the, the white represents all... I hate that story. <laughs> okay? And I'll tell you why. But first, let me finish the story. Okay? And the, the young boy asked his grandfather, he said, well, well, which one will win in this war? And the grandfather says, well, whichever one you feed. Okay? Well, that's true in measure, except that God doesn't need to be fed. There's not an equal balance here between God and the enemy. There's not an equal balance between righteousness and sin. There's not an equal balance between God's grace and my sin. If there were, there would be a chance I could not be saved. Okay? But once I'm saved, I'm saved. Why? Because His grace is greater than. Where sin abounds, grace does abound equally? No. Does much more abound. Right? Okay? So for this idea that there's this co-equal fight going on inside of me <coughs> is wrong. I may have a preference to sin, but God's Spirit that lives inside of me has already accomplished every victory that I'm going to need. All I've got to do is live in the victory that He's already accomplished. Now, easier said than done. Why? Because sometimes I just want to sin. You do too. Don't look down your nose at me. We all choose in the moment. Galatians chapter 5. We just worked through that entire passage, the fruit of the Spirit. But Paul says you have to choose where you're going to walk. Are you going to walk according to the works of the flesh? Or are you going to walk according to the fruit of His Spirit? And sometimes... I told you we went through that series. I have to go. I feel it birth. Okay. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, 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 self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, 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 self-control. <coughs> Love, you just, just self-control. Let's just deal with self-control. Okay? Okay? 
We all have a crucified self. If you have come to Christ, you have been crucified. The old man is dead. The problem is we tend to be great grave dwellers. We tend to hang out at the place where we're buried with fond reminiscence. Oh, I remember when I did that. Oh, yeah, that was a good time. See, this is the dilemma that, that comes in in counting the cost. Jesus says that you have to consider the cost before you accept him. Okay? Now, we have pushed and pushed and pushed in the church to make converts. We have emotional gatherings where God's spirit will be moving and somebody may feel remorse for something that they've done. They feel a need for something. They, they feel an emptiness that needs to be filled. And we rush them up to the front and we pray a prayer with them and turn them loose. Another soul for the kingdom! God did not ask us to make converts. He asked us to make disciples. Okay? You don't bring someone to the very gates of heaven, let them get them to peek inside, and then turn them loose to wander away. You grab them by the scruff of the neck, take them kicking and screaming in. You teach them as Christ taught his disciples and as we have recorded to teach us what we need to live a life worthy. Now we get into the whole thing. You mean I got to be worthy? No, you are worthy. Your life needs to reflect that. Let's, let's put the cart behind the horse, okay? okay? Because the horse, the thing that drives all of this is what God has already accomplished. The price has been paid. Sacrifice has been made. You stand in complete freedom before the law, righteous. Now, after that comes your life. All the things that he wants you to do. Not just the works, but the walking in righteousness. Hebrews chapter 10 says that he has forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Sanctification. The process. The ongoing process. This is a strange dichotomy. How can we at one and the same time be absolutely righteous before God and yet still need to be made holy? Well, because we are working it out. We are learning, we are maturing, we are growing into the person that God desires us to be. What if I fail? God knows you're going to fail. Everybody in here knows you're going to fail. Everybody in here knows you probably already failed. Don't sweat it. Because where your sin abounds, his grace does much more abound. Okay? Now, when do we intervene? When do we step up? Because we're called to step up, right? What happens if you see a brother continuing in sin? Will that brother have victory? He can. He may not choose to live in it. He may not choose to live in it. Matter of fact, there's a certain point when somebody embraces sin that you have to put them out. You have to separate yourself from them. You have to turn them over to Satan why? So he can crush them? So he can beat them up? So he can have his way with them and you can be proved righteous? No. So that they will see how horrible it is outside the umbrella of God's grace. And they will clamor to come back. To be restored. They will look at this thing that they prized so dearly, this treasure that they had, and realize it's garbage. And then they'll look back and see all that God has done for them and they will long for it. Now we get into another question. Can a Christian lose his salvation? <gasps> oh, we're going there. Pastor Glenn, you're not going there. I'm going there. Can a Christian lose their salvation? No. 
absolutely not. You can not lose your salvation. But, but, there's a lot of imposters out there. There's a lot of people out there that believe they're saved. That believe absolutely that they are saved. And they are not. Okay? They are not. Matter of fact, when, when Jesus is talking about them in the Sermon on the Mount, he lists things that they accomplished. And, and man, I mean, they're doing incredible things in his name. Wow, they're doing incredible. I mean, we're looking at people like that, and we make them a televangelist. And we gather a great number of people to follow them. Because they're doing incredible things. But Jesus doesn't know them. He doesn't know them. There are probably people sitting right here in this room that are posers. That are living their life and are probably convinced, yeah, I'm saved. I got it all together. And Jesus doesn't know you. I can't believe you said that, Pastor Glenn. I would be neglect. I would be remiss in the things that God has given me if I didn't. Okay? I would be remiss. Because at the heart of everything that we do, <coughs> we are to be a light in a dark world. At the heart of everything we do, we have got to make sure that the harvest is gathered in. At the heart of everything that we do is God's love for a people that are lost and dying. And if I fail in that task, I don't care how well I exposit the word. I don't care how many visitations I make. I don't care how many people come to this church. If I fail in that, I have failed in my task. <coughs> Okay? Now, I'm not the only one because, see, he's called all of us to that job. Every one of us. Every one of us is his witness. Every one of us is his ambassador. Every one of us is called to be a light in a dark world. Now, when I went to college, I went to a Bible school. I worked at a Christian organization. My wife worked at a Christian organization. And I was, we were, we were youth pastors at a Christian church. Me. We did not, I mean, our, our, our light shone brightly. It's easy for light to shine brightly when it's surrounded by other lights. Man, you come into church, let your light shine. You go out the doors, it should shine all the brighter because of the darkness out there. But if you come in here and you get your light shining and you walk out there and you hide it, you are failing at what he has called you to do. <clears throat> Absolutely failing at what he has called you to do. Okay? Now, uh, Pastor Glenn, I'm, I'm not called to be an evangelist. I didn't say you were. There are those that are gifted and called as evangelists. There are people that just have a heart for that, that go out of their way. But you are called to be his witness. And if you are a Christian, you have something that the world can never deny. You have a testimony. You have what God has done for you you intimately and personally. Okay? And they cannot take that away. They cannot refute that because you know what you were before and you know what he's making you into now. You have gone through the knot hole of the cross and come out on the other side as his. He has given to you the right, the privilege of calling him father. You, you know that's one of my pet peeves. People go, oh, we're all God's children. Wrong. 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 
Absolutely not. John chapter 1 makes it clear. To them that believed, to them that believed, were given the right to be the children of God. And it's only through His Spirit that we're given permission to call Him the <coughs> Father. Romans and Galatians both make that clear. Okay? So, <clears throat> do you believe that God has really done something in you and for you? And if so, then he needs to do something through you. You don't need to be a theologian. You don't need to be an expert in the law. You don't need to be somebody that is uh, incredibly uh, verbose or a gifted orator. You've got to be somebody that just shares the truth. Just shares the truth. You've got to be somebody that when, when the Spirit comes up and just says, hey, pay attention. I want you to go and tell that person that I love them. Okay, God. You realize that person's got tattoos all over everywhere and piercings and, and you know, I can, maybe you can clean them up. No, he loves them like they are right there. He loved them enough right there at that moment that he sent his son to Calvary for them. Okay? And our job is not to make them clean before we present them to them. Our job is to go to them while they're dirty and present God to them. Let him clean them up. He's the, he's the only one that can do it. I mean, man, if I could get all you people to look and act just like me, what a wreck! <laughs> what a miserable bunch of people we would be. Man, I annoy myself. <laughs> oh, you do too. You annoy yourselves. <clears throat> Christy pointed something out to me. You know, how I address myself when I've messed up and when I'm, I'm frustrated with myself, what do I say? Van note. Van note? That was stupid. When I'm doing all right, I don't know how I address myself. If I'm not frustrated, I think I don't talk to myself. <laughs> I don't know. Your job is not to make them look like you. Your job is not to look like you. Our job is to look like him. He's the measuring stick. He's the one that we're to compare ourselves to. He's the one that drives this whole thing. So, believers, you've come to the cross, you've laid your life down. God has taken from it, and he's added back to it. You stand up, and he sends you out. Can you still sin? You betcha. Will you still sin? Yeah, you will. <coughs> you will. Are you going to sin egregiously? Are you going to sin big? Yeah, you probably will. You probably will. But, but, you now have a choice that you didn't have before. You can choose not to. And when you do, you can choose to come right back to him. Knowing that he will forgive you. Because if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Okay. Wrap your brains around that. Really grab a hold of that. He is not only faithful, he will meet you there, but he's also absolutely just to forgive you of those sins. He holds it as a righteous act on his part <coughs> to forgive your sins. Why? Because you're cute? No. No. Because he made sure the price was paid so he could. Next week, 
We're going to talk about the nature of a Christian. The identity that is now yours. Okay? And this is important because we have to know ourselves. <clears throat> we go into battle, we have to know our strengths and our weaknesses. Because the devil does. You have to be aware of areas that you need safeguarding in. I have a, a group of men that I am accountability partners with, and when one of us is struggling, we send a text out. Say, hey, please be praying for me. I'm struggling in this area. And immediately I know that there are at least four men that are praying for me in my struggle. Four men who are lifting me up before the throne of grace interceding on my behalf. And when they struggle, they send out a note, hey, I'm, I'm really struggling today. Pray for me. And sometimes somebody will send an encouraging word. Sometimes somebody will send a scripture. Sometimes they just send back a note to him, <coughs> praying. Look, we have totally missed the call to prayer. Okay? We, we, we come to God with our prayers like this. And off we go. You're welcome. You can have that. <laughs> but what God wants is for us to come before him with our prayers like this. And not getting up until it's done. Not moving from that spot until he's released you. Prayer is what drives everything that we do. Praying for one another. Soliciting others to pray for us. For me. Knowing that somebody's struggling. And getting on your face before God. And imploring him. To move on their behalf. We have got some of the most incredible prayer warriors I've ever had the privilege of knowing in this church. And we have seen incredible things done in this <coughs> church. And I believe it's because people are praying. They are committed to praying. They are committed to getting on their face before God's throne. And praying. And lifting up brothers and sisters. And lifting up those who are enemies of God. Praying for their salvation. Praying for their salvation. Every week, we pray for unsaved loved ones. Every one of us has them. <clears throat> How often are you getting on your face before God and lifting them up? Praying that God would move situation and circumstance in their life. That they would be driven to Him. How often are you getting on your face before him and asking him what he wants of you? Or are you just content with your life the way it is? Don't rock the boat, God. <coughs> it's a blue sky and calm seas. Leave me alone. Because see, when you ask God to move in your life, he'll move. And sometimes it'll get ugly. Sometimes it'll get ugly. Because he wants to work out that stuff in you. And he wants to bring you forth as pure gold. He wants to clothe you in white raiment. He wants you to see and know that you are pure. And sometimes you've got to go through the storm to see it. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Just a moment, please. <coughs> I 
I believe that there are some of you that are struggling with sin, that you feel trapped, ensnared, unable to get free. I really believe that God wants you to know that in Him is freedom. Absolute freedom. The enemy has come against you and he's lied to you. He has said that you are not worthy. He has said you will never overcome this. You will always be dirty before God. And God says that's a lie. <clears throat> because he has told us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. When the Pharisees brought the woman before Jesus, they said, we've caught her in adultery. She is an adulteress. According to the law, she should be stoned. What say you? Jesus didn't even bother responding to their accusations. He knew she was guilty. He knew she was guilty. Instead, he wrote in the dirt and he looked at them and said, whoever of you is without sin, let him throw the first stone. And then he stooped and he wrote in the dirt some more. And away they went, from oldest to youngest, until there was no one there except her. And he looked up and he said, Woman, who condemns you? Where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? God tells you there is no <coughs> one who can condemn you. No one who can condemn you. Because he has paid in full the righteous requirement of the law. There is nothing owing. There is nothing lacking. It has been paid in full. Humble yourself before God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Establish clear thinking Allow God to work in you the miracle of salvation. Allow yourself freedom. Who condemns you? No one. Father, I ask that you would settle in our hearts our place before you. Father, that we would be fixed in mind and purpose what you have done. Father, you have taken our sin and applied it to your righteous, holy, and perfect Son and taken his perfection, his righteousness, your very own righteousness, and given it to us that we would be holy and blameless before you. Father, strengthen us today that we would walk in righteousness. That, Father, we would be attuned to your voice. That we would be soft and pliable before you. Lord God, that we would walk in the victory that was accomplished at Calvary that we would eagerly look forward to that day when we can stand before you. <clears throat> Father, that we are your children, beloved, adored, Father, to live in forgiveness. 
that which you have granted to us, and Father, that we would forgive others, that we would no longer bind ourselves. But Father, we would walk in the freedom that forgiveness brings. Strengthen us, Father, that we might be faithful to be a bright, bright light in a very dark world. Father, that we would be courageous in speaking forth the things that you have accomplished in us, the miracle that you have worked in us. Help us to be compassionate, seeing through your eyes the hurt in the world around us. We bless you, Father, today. We thank you for your grace. Lord God, your grace, your mercy, your steadfast love. We bless you, Father. In Jesus' name.